Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld, director of the Watson Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you all back to, and welcome Chaz Freeman back for the second part of this three-part series. Uh, I think many of you, if not all of you, were here for part one, Diplomacy as Strategy. Today is Diplomacy as Tactics. Last time I, I provided some background about Chaz Freeman's career. I won't recount all that, but I'll simply say that in the last lecture, Chaz demonstrated that in addition to having an extraordinary career as a diplomat, as a foreign service officer and a civil servant, he's um, really the most extraordinary geopolitical thinker that I've ever had the pleasure to interact with. But Chaz does not always leave me, and I'm not sure you do, always leave me feeling terribly optimistic about the <laughs> world. <laughs> Uh, last lecture, Diplomacy as Strategy, I, I'm not sure I, I got all the elements, but one thing I did get was that at least for American policy, uh, there seems to be neither diplomacy nor strategy anymore. Strategy understood as some kind of definition as of a goal and a plan for marshalling resources in as efficient a, ma a manner as possible to achieve that goal. And diplomacy understood as the use of words and persuasion to get counterparts, maybe adversaries, maybe allies, but counterparts to accept a situation that they perhaps wouldn't have been willing to accept otherwise, uh, but that happens to suit the interests of the person or the country making the argument. Uh, Chas presented a, a picture of at least the United States still locked in a kind of a Cold War mentality, a, a trench warfare approach to diplomacy in which the main goal, maybe only goal, is to deny territory to an opponent, um, to deter maybe, to avoid certain kinds of conflicts, but not really to address the conflicts or the underlying sources of those conflicts, and nor to address the new aspirations of countries who are marshalling new kinds of power, soft, hard, and otherwise. Instead, an approach to diplomacy and strategy, or maybe a non-approach to diplomacy and strategy, as one of imperial administration, which alas, doesn't seem to be working too well with the decline of power relative to a number of rising countries, some friendly, some not friendly, and perhaps all increasingly um, indifferent, or at least certainly not willing to kowtow to the United States in ways that might have been possible in the past. Uh, in this lecture, we turn to diplomacy as tactics, and I will say no more. I'll turn it over to you, Chaz, and thank you again for leading us down this path. Well, thank you. Ed says what I meant to say so much better than I can do it. <laughs> yeah, hardly. I had no idea I was that coherent. <laughs> um, in American foreign policy, perpetual warfare, arms races, economic bullying, and derogatory rhetoric seem for the time being to have supplanted diplomacy. This is a profoundly destabilizing approach to foreign relations. Once it's run its course, the United States will need to rediscover, reconstitute, and rebuild diplomatic capacity. Our objective in doing so should be to train and field diplomats who are as skilled in the profession of persuasion as our military are in the profession of arms. The extent to which we're able to draw on diplomatic doctrine, guidance for the application of judgment to trends, events, and opportunities will determine the speed and effectiveness with which we can accomplish this. We need to work now on developing such doctrine for application to our foreign policies and practices uh, when that is possible. Diplomacy is an instrument of statecraft that few Americans have been educated to understand and whose history, even in relation to our own country, most do not know. Diplomacy emphasizes peaceably arranged change, but it is not pacifist. Diplomacy is how power persuades states and peoples to accommodate adjustments in relations that they instinctively disfavor. It uses words to portray capabilities and convey intentions in order to shape the calculus of foreign pa partners and opponents and cause them to make desired changes in their policies and behavior. Diplomacy is the verbal tactics of foreign relations. It is the alternative to the use of force, as well as its prelude, facilitator, and finale. 
It is both the implementer of policy by measures short of war and the translator of the results of war into durable outcomes. Americans celebrate our independence on the day of its official declaration, July 4th, 1776. Most imagine that we attained our autonomy then or on October 19, 1781, when we and the French defeated the British at Yorktown. But this ahistorical view disregards the essential role of diplomacy in the adjustment of relations. U.S. separation from the British Empire was only secured when the British conceded it. It took John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and Thomas Jefferson nearly two years to persuade the British to accept that the necessary consequence of their military defeat was American independence. That became a legal reality only on September 3, 1783, when Britain and the United States signed the Treaty of Paris. The failure of Americans to recognize the centrality of diplomacy to war termination, including in our own war of independence, is not inconsequential. Recall the ludicrous triumphalism of President George W. Bush after the defeat of the Iraqi army in 2003 when he stood on an aircraft carrier under a banner reading, Mission Accomplished. Subsequent events in Iraq provided a costly reminder that no war is over until the defeated admit defeat and accept its consequences. Such adjustments do not happen automatically. They are achieved through diplomacy or not at all. The tragic American experience in Iraq is also a reminder that to achieve peace, there must be a leader among the defeated populace with the authority to commit them to it. This is why the United States left the Japanese emperor on the throne after World War II. The failure to consider, let alone address, the question of who might be able to commit Iraqis to cooperation with their foreign occupiers and what would be required to persuade them to, to, to do it accounted in no small measure for the anarchy that followed the removal of the Saddam regime in Baghdad. Diplomatic tactics for war termination are an essential element of any war strategy. But the translation of military triumph into political victory is a task that the American way of war all too often omits. This reflects a history of pursuing the annihilation of enemies, their unconditional surrender, and their political reconstruction through occupation. Think of the Civil War, think of World War I, think of World War II. Disdain for diplomacy that negotiates post-war adjustments in relations together with mission creep is a major reason that so many American wars spin on without end or abate only to resume an altered form. Most Americans seem to see diplomacy in war as a discontinuous dichotomy. But diplomacy does not halt when war begins, nor does the role of military power end when peace replaces war. Effective diplomatic communication is essential to escalation control. It's also necessary to convince enemies to make concessions that justify ending wars with them on agreed terms. War is the pursuit of policy through violent coercion up to and including mass murder. It does not supplant the need to pursue policy by other means. Enemies must be made to see that it is in their interest to agree to terms rather than to suffer devastation or annihilation. This makes diplomatic communication more important than ever in times of war. One should never lose contact with the enemy on the battlefield or at the negotiating table. Even when the objective of war is unconditional surrender, which by the way is generally a counterproductive posture that incentivizes maximum resistance by the enemy, diplomacy is important to lay the basis for the post-war order. It is not the military end state that vindicates strategy. It is the political end state. 
For wars with limited objectives to end, the combatants must be able to end their combat through a negotiated resolution of, on terms that they consider acceptable. The fact that they are fighting makes it all the more important that they talk. There, this consideration is why the Chinese, contrary to Western practice, wisely left their embassies in place during their conflicts with both India and Vietnam. The need to preserve the negotiability of differences is also why Bismarck can, can counseled that one should be polite even when conveying a declaration of war. Diplomacy is the run-up to war and during it serves to prevent still other adversaries from becoming enemies, to preclude the formation of hostile co coalitions, to deny alliances to adversaries, and to divide enemies from their allies and partners. Wartime diplomacy also works to bolster one's own alliances and partnerships, to extract concessions from actual and potential belligerents, and to lay the groundwork for order and stability to succeed mayhem. Far from ending during warfare, diplomacy complements military operations and enables them to fulfill their political purposes. It's how the warring parties translate the results of their combat in adjustments, into adjustments in relations between them. As important as diplomacy is to the fruitful conduct of war, it is also the principal and most effective alternative to it. In some respects, diplomacy can be likened to jujitsu, the use of an enemy's strength, energy, desires, preconceptions, and mode of coercive attack, action to match, misdirect, disarm, and counter him. Success depends on knowing what one wants, understanding one's opponent's preoccupations, being prepared, seeing one's objective through one's opponent's eyes as well as one's own, exemplifying stamina and resilience, and knowing when to exploit openings when they occur. For the most part, Americans have not thought about the role of diplomacy in the expansion of the United States to its present borders. Some of the diplomacy that built America was peaceful. Some involved financial transactions. Some represented the translation of military success into territorial adjustments and other concessions. American diplomacy opportunistically exploited strategic calculations on the part of the foreign nations with which the United States was negotiating to make America great. Here are a few examples. In 1802, President Thomas Jefferson authorized James Monroe and Robert Livingston to try to buy New Orleans, and if possible, Florida, for up to $9,375,000. Napoleon had just suffered a dispiriting defeat in Haiti and written off French colonial ambitions in the Western Hemisphere. He needed money. On April 11, 1803, Napoleon unexpectedly offered to sell the United States all of France's remaining territories in North America. Without waiting for instructions, Monroe and Livingston set about negotiating a treaty purchasing France's Louisiana territory for 11 and a quarter million dollars plus the forgiveness of three and three quarter million dollars in French debt. It took them two weeks to reach this agreement with the French. Their opportunistic diplomacy peacefully doubled the size of the United States at a cost of about three cents per acre. Had Americans tried to take this territory by force rather than diplomacy, we could have succeeded, if at all, only at vastly greater expense in treasure as well as blood. It would have been interesting to see what Napoleon did to our ragtag army if we had tried that. In 1844, President James K. Polk was elected on an aggressively expansionist platform. At the time, the border between the United States and Canada, British Canada, west of the Continental Divide was in dispute. Polk threatened to go to war with Britain over the issue. Negotiations between his Secretary of State and the British envoy to Washington 
began in the summer of 1845. Britain made a deliberate decision to appease the United States rather than entrench a hostile relationship with this rising power. In 1846, the two sides concluded the Oregon Treaty. This confirmed US sovereignty south of the 49th parallel everywhere but on an undivided Vancouver Island. Polk's diplomatic success enabled him to turn his combative attention to Texas. In 1846, he provoked war with Mexico. In the negotiations that followed the U.S. Army's victory, the United States insisted on maximum terms for Mexico, softened, softened by financial inducements. The resulting Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed on February 2nd, 1848, ended Mexican resistance, resigned Mexico to the U.S. annexation of Texas, and compelled it to sell California and the rest of its territory north of the Rio Grande. In 1853, the U.S. ambassador to Mexico, James Gad Gadsden, was able to buy additional territory from a still intimidated Mexico uh, through which to route a southern transcontinental railway. There was a northern one, northern one being built, and what became the Confederate States insisted on a southern route as well, $15 million. In 1859, Russia offered to sell Alaska to the United States, hoping that this would position Americans to counter British power in the North Pacific. The U.S. Civil War intervened. But in 1867, Secretary of State William Seward took up a renewed Russian offer and was able to arrange terms for the territorial transfer. The U.S. acquisition of Alaska ended Russia's presence in North America and ensured American access to both the Pacific's northern rim and the Arctic. In normal times, diplomacy is not much concerned with re redefining frontiers, but with arranging and policing the terms of trade, investment, and other citizen and corporate interactions across borders. The first treaties that American diplomats negotiated were treaties of commerce and navigation. These were bilateral agreements designed to outflank British and other colonial mercantilism. They typically in ensured both the uh, most favored nation treatment with respect to trade uh, they, uh, they enshrined national treatment and prohibited discrimination. They offered access to local courts or ar arbit arbitral tribunals, exchanged consular officers to promote trade and investment and protect citizens, and established the rules for commerce and shipping in times of war. Sixty-three such treaties remain in force in the United States today. Despite the late 20th century replacement of their primitive bilateral regulation of trade in maritime commerce with the more sophisticated and efficient administration of the World Trade Organization and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. These and other treaties define the multilateral framework of globalization from which the Trump administration is now withdrawing the United States. The American abandonment of multilateral trade and investment diplomacy combined with aggressive protectionism that ignores previous, previously existing norms foreshadows future U.S. isolation and irrelevance in global economic governance. Other major trading nations show no interest at all in replacing multilateral institutions and the globalized economy they regulate with new bilateral relations with the United States or each other. On the contrary, they are going ahead with new multilateral schemes that bypass or exclude the United States. Examples include the Japanese-led revival of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Cooperation, or RCEP, in Southeast Asia, led by China and India, burgeoning arrangements under China's Belt and Road uh, initiative, and policy harmonization and standard setting under the Paris Climate Accord. Future American administrations will find themselves on the outside of these arrangements trying to get in. Resentment of American unilateralism is replacing allegiance 
to U.S. leadership. Readmission to the councils of governance in an order that has been redefined without American input will demand an unprecedented level of skill from U.S. diplomats in future. It's not new for the United States to exempt itself from global norms. What is new is the relative decline in American power in relation to others and the norms that they have accepted. As an example, the United States, this sounds trivial, but it isn't, is now the only country, the only country not to use the metric system. This ensures that American products cannot meet the standards of foreign markets without redesign or, or conversion. This difference has not been much of an impediment for the U.S. economy, given its size, dynamism, and ability to print dollars instead of go exporting goods and services to pay for imports. But as the U.S. absents itself from multilateral institutions, others will see an opportunity to use differences like this to their competitive advantage. I've personally seen American industry lose literally billions of dollars in markets abroad to the combination of U.S. complacency and foreign exploitation of standard setting to exclude the import of U.S. products. I can tell you some interesting stories about that if you're interested when I finish. In a globalized world, lack of alertness to such issues makes one uncompetitive. The pseudo-populist plutocrats of the Trump administration came into office asserting that the open world economic order that successive American, previous American administrations had fostered was unfair and had victimized the American worker. The United States has now set the rules it created and enforced for so many decades aside. This is not just isolating America. It is severely undermining global order and governance. Meanwhile, alliances are becoming conditional, transforming themselves into ententes. Protectorates are decoupling themselves from their protectors as confidence in the reliability of security guarantees wanes. Client states are cynically abandoning allegiances and repositioning themselves between patrons. In the new world disorder, survival amidst prosperity will demand proficiency in the tactics of diplomatic maneuver. If the key to sound strategy of any kind is whether one is asking the right question, the key to sound tactics is to ask, and then what, before taking action. Strategy must be set at the top but tactics are best driven from the bottom or from the field in. These, those on the front lines are best positioned to judge the most effective tactics for pursuing strategic objectives in the circumstances they face. But the current trend is towards centralization of American decision making in Washington and within Washington in the White House. The substitution of deductive reasoning from ideological presuppositions for inductive reasoning and the disparagement of expertise and experience. Often this sort of narcissistic policy disorder, to quote George Will, results in resort to attempted economic coercion through sanctions. Sanctions are politically attractive. They sever relationships and unravel ties that bind parties together. The immediate damage they do is regrettably almost always reciprocal. Groups and activities on both sides suffer. But the pain usually falls directly on parts of the private sector and very indirectly on the public at large. Not at all on the politicians demanding punitive action or the government of which they are part. The sanctions are effective political theater even if they almost never work. There are numerous, numerous reasons for this. The first is the nature of economic power. Unlike military power, which persuades by menacing the life, liberty, and happiness of those to whom it is applied, economic ties draw their power from the gains nations, companies, and individuals 
make from exchanging what they have for what they don't. Like a string, economic power connects people, companies and individuals, and enables them to pull each other together. It induces cooperation through mutually benef beneficial trade and investment. This makes economic measures ideal tools of any strategy aimed at building communities or other cooperative international relationships as the political effects of removing trade barriers in the European community or the growth of the Sinocentric supply chain economy in East Asia both illustrate. But the fact that economic power links and encourages rather than sunders or discourages profitable exchanges of goods and services between nations also makes economic power a very poor tool of coercion. You can pull on a string, you can't push on it. Second, sanctions can be essential bargaining chips to be traded for concessions by their target, but this requires that they be part of a negotiating strategy, not a punitive end in themselves. At the bargaining table, sanctions are useful as threats. The fear of sanctions, the precise effects of which can seldom be modeled with accuracy, is generally more compelling than their actual, uh, their actual effect. If sanctions are in fact imposed, their only utility comes in their removal in exchange for concessions that are part of the deal. But the longer sanctions are in place, the more difficult they are to remove. Third, sanctions, once sanctions are put in place, two things routinely happen. Their efficacy begins to be measured not by their effect on the policies and behavior of their target, but by the pain they are seen to inflict on it. Their original purpose of compelling changes in behavior by their target is effectively forgotten. While the politicians grandstand, markets quickly adjust to the distortions in supply and demand that sanctions create. The government that is the object of the sanctions engages in import substitution, finds other suppliers, and institutionalizes smuggling to meet the demand for whatever it's been deprived of. This is good for the target's domestic industry, the economic competitors of the power that's imposing the sanctions, and the profits of organized crime. Fourth, as new patterns of commerce set in, some in the country imposing sanctions come to count on the protection from foreign competition that sanctions afford. As an example, consider the opposition of American sugar producers to the lifting of sanctions that preclude Cuba, which is a much lower cost sugar producer from selling sugar in the United States. Some in the target country or in third countries also acquire a vested interest in the continuation of sanctions. Consider the growth of the armaments and other industries under sanctions uh, in apartheid era South Africa, or the emergence of Brazil as an alternative source of soybeans for Japan and other importers after the Nixon, administra Nixon administration foolishly restricted their export in 1973. Fifth, like a war for which, or like war, for which it is spuriously touted as a substitute, sanctions punish, but do not automatically translate into changes in policy or behavior on the part of their target. Ostracism does not persuade, it enrages. Unacceptable demands are not made acceptable by maximum pressure and attempted public humiliation unaccompanied by a credible negotiating process. Nations are at their most dangerous when they perceive an existential threat or an injustice from which there is no potential relief through diplomatic dialogue. Recall that Japan reacted to such sanctions with a desperate attack on Pearl Harbor. Finally, even when integrated into a negotiating process, sanctions increase public pressure but thereby just encourage resistance, exacerbate recalcitrance, facilitate shifting the blame for everything going wrong domestically to those imposing the sanctions, rally nationalists against perceived foreign bullying, and make compromise politically more rather than less uh, 
difficult. So sanctions typically retard rather than speed agreement at the negotiating table. In the end, as the Iran nuclear non-proliferation deal illustrated, the only utility of sanctions is their removal. This can seldom produce a deal resolving the dispute that justified them, but it can serve as a bonus to such a deal. In the new world disorder, the American advantages that once gave unilateral U.S. sanctions their unique impact are all disappearing. In 1950, the United States provided 16.7% of the world's exports and took a whopping 81% of its imports. In 2016, these figures have fallen to 9.1 and 13.8% respectively. A disproportionate percentage of American exports now consists of financial and other services for which there is an increasing range of alternative non-American sources. This makes America a very powerful, but no longer dominant force in international trade and investment. Americans have fewer followers internationally and a declining ability to impose economic and financial isolation on our foreign adversaries. In these circumstances, as the United States, as the issuer of the principal currency for settling international transactions, has come to rely on our sovereignty over the dollar to block trade and investment with countries like Iran, North Korea, and Russia. But this effectively imposes U.S. policies to which they object on economic powers like China, India, Japan, and South Korea. As these countries see it, the United States is abusing its power as the issuer of the preeminent global currency. This is driving them to explore workarounds and substitutes to the dollar in their own trade with countries under U.S. sanctions. If they succeed, the consequences for Americans could be a catastrophic loss of the exorbitant privilege of printing money to pay for imports that we have long enjoyed. In any event, current trends guarantee that future gener generations of American diplomats will le have less financial coercive power to work with. This will test their negotiating skills in ways that previous generations have not experienced. Diplomatic negotiation is a teachable art. It differs from negotiation in other contexts because it takes place between nations, not citizens subject to coercion by the sovereign authority of their government through litigation in its courts. The participants in diplomatic negotiation have the option of resorting at any time to the use of force against each other. They can choose to accept or ignore the, the uh, prevalent norms and rules of international law and implicit agreements on rules by one side cannot guarantee that the other side will adhere to them. If diplomatic negotiations fail, the result is protracted impasse escalating tensions or armed conflict, not a lawsuit leading to a court decision and penalties. One of the issues, I believe, in the president's performance is that his experience is limited to real estate transactions, most, many of which pr were pursued coercively in the courts. There is no court above national sovereignty internationally. All the more reason to demand excellence from those charged with conducting such negotiation. Diplomatic negotiation should be viewed as an application of national power by measures short of war. The object is to per persuade one's opponent to embrace the need to accommodate one's demands, faute de mieux. The purpose of diplomacy is not to reach agreement with the other side. It is not to reach agreement with the other side but to achieve the end state one's strategy requires. Very occasionally, not talking is a form of negotiation. It can allow time to ripen circumstances conducive to concessions by one's adversary, for example, by inciting quarrels between it and third parties, encouraging the insurrection against it, or demonstrating one's coercive capabilities against a third party in a show of force. 
or it could mean using talks to shelve issues, stall for time to strengthen one's position, allow the situation to evolve in one's favor, create a crisis that forces the other side to make decisions it would otherwise evade, or make the other side appear to have been so unreasonable as to leave no alternative but the use of force against it. Stalling for time can also mean entering talks but conceding only minor points, insisting that the major issues or principles be reserved until they can be resolved to one's advantage. Diplomatic intercourse should never be seen as a favor to the other side, but as a convenience to one's own. It is a means by which to convey one's position directly to an adversary, to listen to its reasoning about its position on the issues in contention, to argue for changing changes in that reasoning, and to warn, cajole, and probe for evidence of willingness to concede specific points. Direct dialogue can lend gravitas and the credibility of body language to threats or carefully articulated offers to compromise in ways that written messages or communication through intermediaries cannot. It can help develop constructive ambiguity, repair bruised amour propre, facilitate cooperation on issues of common concern notwithstanding confrontation on other matters, develop personal relationships that ease the resolution of disputes or enable collusion once opportunities ripen for it and provide a distraction for the media. Meetings with adversaries are the theater in which diplomacy best struts its stuff. The major task of diplomacy is the management of relationships. In the new world disorder, these seem certain to be more fluid than they were in the last century. Transactionalism seems set to replace friendships and animosities. The progressive debilitation of the admittedly imperfect protections of international law is leaving countries with no alternative to defending themselves as best they can with whatever weaponry they can build or acquire. Relationships embodying obligations are diminishing, freeing states to maneuver in accordance with their interests as they see them. There are likely to be many ententes, but progressively fewer alliances and protectorates. The rivalries in a multipolar state system are unlikely to support many client states, that is, free riders on the ambitions of a single great power patron. Smaller states are likely to consider strat strategic promiscuity a safer course than bonding with a particular nation. When in, when, where interests for a time coincide, nations will cooperate. Where and when they do not, they will not. This environment will penalize diplomatic Im immobility and incompetence and reward agility, flexibility, versatility, and responsiveness to change that underwrites adaptation, resilience, and innovative approaches to deal with new problems and opportunities. Some international relationships are bound to be adversarial. Diplomacy must seek to forestall the transformation of adversaries into active enemies. That is, unless, as is rarely the case, overt hostility by one foreign party can stimulate rapprochement by a larger, more capable nation whose support would facilitate the pursuit of other, more important issues. It is usually in the national interest to inhibit the evolution of relations from skepticism to passive resistance to active opposition on issues. Such evolution can lead to broadly adversarial relations. Adversarial relations easily become broad hostility or even enmity. During the Cold War, the United States learned to rely on deterrence rather than diplomacy to address potentially explosive situations. This made sense in a world order with essentially fixed frontiers between two great blocks of states in which the United States enjoyed unmatched coercive power. But in the context of disorder and fluid relations between states, it should not be the first resort of statecraft. 
deterrence leaves the, the causes of potential conflict to evolve for the worse. It stimulates arms races, invites countermeasures, generates security dilemmas, and often precludes cooperation on unrelated matters. Its effect is to prevent problems from exploding now, but to leave them to explode later. Sometimes the passage of time erases or alleviates the danger that disputes might erupt in armed conflict, but it can also permit them to fester and enlarge their potential to produce catastrophe. Delay makes sense when one's power is growing relative to that of others. But strong as the United States is and will remain, others are growing ever stronger. The balance of economic and military power is shifting away from America. In these circumstances, deferring problems for later resolution assures that when and if they come to a head, U.S. leverage will have weakened, even as the outcome of conflict has become more uncertain. Future American diplomacy must focus first on resolving disputes, not perpetuating them. Ignorance is the cause of fear, Seneca reminds us. Fear generates suspicion. This easily becomes hostility. Mutual familiarity may not breed affection, but it is the best cure for imagined security dilemmas in which each side's defensive responses to the other are seen as threatening and requiring an escalatory response. Losing contact with the enemy on the battlefield risks surprise, flanking or encirclement. Halting communication with a diplomatic opponent carries similar risks. The principle of statecraft embodied in what the Arabs call Mu'awiyah's hair applies. The second Umayyad caliph, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, famously declared, should there be but one hair between me and the others, I would not have it cut. For if they slacken, I would pull. And if they pull, I would slacken it a bit. The danger of substituting protracted deterrence for diplomacy, the dangers are well illustrated, I think, in the current confrontation between the United States and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. For 65 years, U.S. policy toward the North Korean regime has consisted of containment through ostracism, embargo, confrontation, and military shows of force. There is no gainsaying the despicable cruelty and thuggish belligerence of the Kim dynasty. But at no point has the United States which is unquestionably the stronger party, developed a strategy for coexistence with North Korea. There has been no American initiative to seek replacement of the 1953 armistice with a peace, despite the commitment of the signatories to that armistice, including us, to do that. Instead, American policy has consistently projected the collapse of the North Korean regime or its conquest if large-scale con combat on the Korean peninsula resumes. The, United, the North Korean response has been a desperate drive to develop nuclear weapons to deter, deter the United States or deter direct or indirect U.S. imposition of regime change in Pyongyang. This effort has now achieved or is nearing success. It has also produced a breakthrough for North Korean diplomacy in the form of American agreement to a summit meeting, something that Pyongyang has long sought. The mere fact of this meeting confirms the importance of the DPRK, its new status as the possessor of nuclear weapon deterrent, and by implication, the legitimacy of both its state and its security concerns. President Trump agreed to this meeting on the basis of a South Korean readout of a private conversation with Chairman Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un, in which no Americans were present and to which record no American has been privy. So far as we know, Chairman Kim has not confirmed the President's interpretation of his words directly or indirectly. They've been left in the realm of hearsay. Talking with adversaries is usually better than not talking, provided you know what you're going to say and are confident you know what you're 
counterpart can and cannot accept. Direct communication with North Korea's leaders on terms that convey respect for their power, but not their policies, may prove to be the key to a breakthrough. But it could also very well produce a catastrophe. <laughs> That's bound to be the case if the president simply repeats past American positions and does not address the fears that underlie North Koreans' policy. From Chairman Kim's perspective, the United States has been saying, if you don't disarm yourself, we reserve the right to kill you. So give up your deterrent now, and then we'll see what we can work out. <laughs> Libya's Colonel Gaddafi took a chance on a similar offer and gave up his weapons programs. A few years later, he was memorialized by the US Secretary of State with the words, we came, we saw, he died. It will be very difficult to persuade Kim Jong-un to place his trust in the United States. Summits between adversaries are the diplomatic equivalent of single combat to decide battles between armies. Summits risk everything on the outcome of one encounter. If they're well prepared, sorry, um, they add a direct clash between egos to a contest of interests. If they're well prepared, summits can ratify or finalize agreements and consolidate new relationships. But they can also exacerbate and further entrench confrontation. Given the stakes, summits are seldom, if ever, undertaken without extensive prior consultation and negotiation between subordinates. They proceed only when such dialogue is confirmed that an encounter between leaders has a high probability of producing a breakthrough rather than a setback in relations. In some ways, despite the vast superiority of military power on the part of the US, President Trump will find himself at a disadvantage at any summit he may have with Mr. Kim. The United States has never had many experts on the DPRK. The past year has seen an exodus from the US government of most of the American diplomats and officials with, direct, with experience of direct contact with North Korean counterparts. By contrast, the North Korean side is staffed with officials who've spent decades dealing with Americans. The balance of expertise favors Pyongyang, not Washington. So does the balance of fervor. The issues for Chairman Kim and his country are existential. President Trump's personal prestige may depend on the outcome of a meeting with Chairman Kim, but the future of the United States does not. As Mr. Trump often says, we will see what happens. Whatever that is, American diplomats need to learn from it. The US military has a healthy habit of after action reviews to learn from what went right, what went wrong, and what might have been done better in an engagement. Sometimes what is learned is sufficiently important to be incorporated into doctrine. More commonly, it provides insights into how training can be improved. A reconstituted, more professional United States Foreign Service should institutionalize similar reviews of its own performance and make them as mandatory and routine as the inspection, inspection of management functions and embass in embassies and other diplomatic organizations now is. The constant review of experience is essential to extract and test the hypotheses that constitute the doctrine, the institutional memory, and essential skill set of any profession. The substance of diplomacy involves maneuvers between states and peoples. These are both intellectually fascinating and emotionally engaging. Much ink is, is spilt de describing and analyzing them. Diplomats, even retired diplomats, easily become fixated on the issues with which diplomacy must grapple and fail to focus on the process and the methodologies by which such grappling must be done. But such a focus is the sine qua non of mastery of the diplomatic arts. Such mastery will be essential for the recovery of American leadership once the current self-inflicted weakening of the United States 
political economic role in world affairs is behind us. Diplomacy is a universal skill, not the preserve of any particular nation or its history. There's a great deal to be learned from the ways in which the statesmen of other countries manage or fail to manage the issues that confront them. But the American experience alone is rich in examples of effective diplomatic tactics. It's time for Americans to start mining that experience for the lessons it contains and to incorporate what we learn in a teachable body of interrelated operational concepts or a doctrine. The raw materials to build such diplomatic doctrine are before us. We just need to exploit them. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for discussion, I believe. We do. Uh, maybe I'll just start with the first question, then we'll, we'll open it up. I, I wonder, Chaz, whether you could take the, the, the precepts you put forward and use them to critique or, or analyze a, a particular example of American policy or diplomacy across two administrations, so the Obama administration, the Trump administration, with respect to the Sunni Shia divide. So I'm asking this question. It's a, a topic I know nothing about beyond my maybe having watched Frontline. Uh, but, but the Obama administration negotiated a momentous deal, the Iran nuclear deal, but that apparently um, was viewed as a travesty by the Saudis, traditional Sunni powers, Israel. The Trump administration has moved in a different direction, um, condemning that deal extending a, a hand to Saudi Arabia, supporting Saudi Arabia in a war in Yemen. So what, we, we seem in the United States to be all over the place. What, what's the appropriate approach to a fluid situation of the kind represented by the, by the Sunni Shia split? I don't believe uh, the Obama administration was able to deal effectively with the Middle East um, on many levels. Um, in part, that reflected um, the hammerlock on U.S. politics that the Israel lobby has, which prevents any consideration of altering uh, an approach to Israel, basically leaves the United States in the position of enabler of whatever it is that Israel wants to do, much as an alcoholic is enabled by someone who hands money to them regardless of how they, they spend it. Um, so that uh, issue arose almost immediately in the administration on the settlements issue. Um, one, uh, one, one thing that you do learn in diplomacy is that almost everything is interconnected. The price of overt Arab cooperation with the United States until recently has been um, some degree of display on the part of the United States of an interest in addressing the injustices to the Palestinians, who are Arabs after all. Um, not that they are popular among other Arabs. Um, so um, the, the Obama administration started off with a, um, a problem with the state of Israel and with Arabs over the same issue, which is Israeli settlements and annexation expansion of territory. The Israelis objecting because Obama had made an issue of this, the Arabs objecting because he hadn't. Um, you know, sometimes you can't win. The Trump administration has started out with a capitulation to Israel. Um, that uh, is, has been accepted by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, but nobody else, on the grounds of expediency because it is the price of, um, in their view, of American backing for a possible future war with Iran. Uh, so there's an implicit deal there. The, uh, in fact, the Saudis and the Israelis are now overtly collaborating on, against Iran in quite a number of arenas. It began in the intelligence arena and then extended to lobbying in Washington, where they're, they're hand in glove. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, it, now, um, uh, it, 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 it now is a feature of um, the geopolitics of the Middle East. Um, for a while. Um, the, uh, so this issue, the issues don't change 
uh, but the man manner in which you handle them uh, does change. Um, the, uh, at the moment, I should say, um, uh, the, the, the pressure on the Saudis, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who is the crown prince who's been here, gave an interview to Jeffrey Goldberg, the Atlantic, uh, which Goldberg, I think, misinterpreted. Um, and and uh, what Mohammed bin Salman said was, uh, Israelis and Palestinians are both entitled to their own land. Uh, Goldberg took that as a, uh, Jews are entitled to a state in the Middle East <coughs> statement, which is a slightly different um, proposition. Um, at any rate, the reaction to this in Saudi Arabia was apparently sufficiently severe that the king had to call President Trump and badger him on the issue of peace in the Middle East. Uh, on the issue of Iran per se, uh, there is a mismatch, as is often the case, between the various uh, parties aligned against Iran. Uh, on the one hand, um, the, uh, the, the Israeli concern is overwhelmingly uh, to deal with the prospective loss of Israel's nuclear monopoly in the Middle East and the perceived threat to Israel from a, a putative Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, on the Saudi side, uh, the Emirati side, uh, the Emiratis have a uh, territorial dispute with Iran over the Lesser Tums Islands, which are in the Strait of Hormuz, um, Persian Gulf meeting the Arabian Gulf. Um, the, but aside from that, um, they both the Emiratis and the Saudis are deeply disturbed by the political inroads that uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq and subsequent actions uh, have given uh, Iran. Uh, their main focus is on uh, Iranian prestige and influence, not on Iran's nuclear weapons. But they're prepared to go along with the nuclear agenda because it facilitates the pursuit of their own agenda, just as the Israelis are prepared to go along with the Saudi agenda because it facilitates their agenda. Um, this is not an alliance, um, and it is a very limited partnership, um, and uh, needs to be recognized as such. Uh, so um, we will see um, uh, the, the Trump administration essentially is handed, is, is, has handed, has has taken enablement of Israel and extended it to Saudi Arabia, uh, which is uh, why we don't seem to be able to do anything very constructive on the issue of Yemen, uh, which is a Saudi misadventure uh, that um, uh, is, um, uh, is something that many in Saudi Arabia would not like to bring to an end, but can't quite figure out how to do. Um, so um, uh, all of this fits, I think, rather nicely into the analysis I provided uh, in the last talk about different categories of, of relationship. Uh, where will this end? Um, I think it is entirely possible now that the Saudis would in fact cooperate with an Israeli strike on Iran by facilitating overflight um, because that would serve their, uh, their purposes. Um, they would hope if that happened as the Israelis would hope that it would drag the United States into a war with Iran. Once again, and this gets to tactics, uh, people in the United States, and there are quite a few now, concentrated in the administration, and John Bolton being uh, perhaps the most prominent, but Mike Pompeo also fitting in this category, uh, want, to, want to strike Iran with force. Uh, but none of them have an answer to, and then what? Um, you know, do we send in troops on the ground? We would have to. Um, so uh, we are recapitulating the same sort of uh, errors of judgment that, I have, that we have seen in the George W. Bush, the Obama, the Obama administration, uh, and now, now in this one. Nothing has been learned. So um, that's a long-winded answer, probably not entirely responsive to your, your question. Uh, but um, uh, from a strategic point of view and from a tactical point of view, it's not clear we have any idea at all what we're doing. Questions? Yes. Um, 
I, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say that having lived in Israel for long periods of time, that there are Israelis and Palestinians who are trying very hard to come together. They establish friendships. They eat together. And I think that's very important. I agree with you. Yeah. Un unfortunately, that is a rarer and rarer phenomenon in, uh, in today's Middle East. Yeah. You know, what we have going on at the moment is essentially a firing squad in the form of si snipers uh, firing into peacefully demonstrated crowds in Gaza with enormous death and wounding <laughs> taking place. Uh, this is deeply disturbing to more, the more thoughtful among the Israeli public. Uh, but I'm sorry to say that the overall mood is chauvinistic and highly supportive of the sniping, not sympathetic to the victims. Questions? The question over here. And on the Palestinian side, there is a sense of desperation. Yes. I, I, I don't want to uh, make this more depressing, but um, uh, Trump, has, Trump has met with Putin. Uh, we find out maybe he said something in a conversation recently about hoping to meet with him again. There is a summit being prepared. Yeah. Um, I hope it's being prepared. Um, it I will guess, occur whether it's prepared or yeah, not. I guess, I, I guess that's my question is, is the, uh, the, the lack of any uh, advanced uh, diplomacy that you uh, identified with regard to North Korea will likely mean, you know, two guys with immense egos uh, getting together and looking into each other's souls and seeing different things. But uh, is there, you know, what here should be a strategy? And then from that point, it, maybe there's no hope for a strategy. It, it, strategy is just a uh, opportunity to get some publicity. But is there anything that could possibly good come of that? Um, I think Mr. Trump's instinct, whatever generates it, um, there are many theories about uh, some sort of blackmail uh, from Russia being in the background of his unwillingness to criticize Mr. Putin. Um, we have no evidence of that, so it's a matter of conjecture. Whatever motivates his judgment that we should be dealing with Mr. Putin, that judgment is correct. Mr. Putin is the leader, the very effective leader, I should say, and very popular leader, partly because we've been so against him uh, that we've aroused Russian nationalism in support of him. Um, he is uh, he's the, the leader of an important country which uh, took advantage of American fumbling over the last decade to become more important, to reestablish a position of leadership in the Middle East, for example, uh, and a, almost a controlling position uh, in Syria, in particular. Uh, I would note on the, under the category of client states, um, you know, moving their allegiance, uh, that Egypt seems to be once again in motion uh, toward Russia and away from the United States. Uh, so uh, Mr. Putin, both in the European context uh, and in the Middle Eastern context, is someone with whom we have to deal. Um, and it's most unfortunate that uh, anti-Russian hysteria, uh, a lot of it highly partisan in nature, uh, by way of an excuse for why the election went the way it did in 2016, uh, has prevented sober discussion of what the U.S. and Russia ought to do together. Uh, I'll, I, will, I will make two points in that regard, one I've made before. Um, if you look strategically at the issue of Russia, and Europe, its relationship with Europe, the problem of Ukraine. Um, you, at least I am struck by the difference between the wisdom of the uh, European victors, the British, uh, the Russians, and others after the defeat of Napoleon, 1815, instead of excluding revolutionary France or the remains of France from participation in the European order and its governance, uh, they integrated them uh, at the Congress of Vienna. And the result was 100 years from 1815 to 1914 of relative peace in a space which had previously been constantly roiled by war. 
1919, after World War I, the victors excluded a powerful state, Germany, and also Russia, which made it easy to exclude it by having had a, 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 a bunch of thugs in charge uh, after the Bolshevik Re Revolution. And that didn't work out very well. It produced Nazism, World War II, and the Cold War. Um, and so I, I think the real question with respect to Russia is not how to exclude it from a role in Europe, but to how to give it a stake in stability in Europe, how to make it partner in the management of European issues. Hint, you don't do that by mauling Serbia from the air which was the Clinton administration's approach, given the historic relationship between the Serbs and the Russians. Um, and uh, in a way, we set a precedent for what Mr. Putin did uh, in Crimea. Uh, we detached Kosovo from Serbia with no authority from uh, the United Nations or anyone else um, by force. Uh, he did it through a, a little green man and a, a referendum. Both the Kosovars and the Crimeans were both delighted by the change. Um, the Serbs and Ukrainians were not. Um, anyway, I think we need to think, we need to reframe the question. Uh, we need to think about how to make Ukraine a viable, prosperous, stable, democratic state that is a bridge and a buffer between Russia and the rest of Europe, uh, and not how to arm it to fight um, for Ukrainian chauvinism. Um, in the Middle East, uh, the war is over in Syria for all intents and purposes. Um, a few, five days ago, the president, our, our president, said we were about to leave. Yesterday, he said we're going to stay there indefinitely. Um, there's no evidence of what strategy is represented by either statement. But um, it would seem to me uh, that uh, if the justification for the U.S. is, as the President says, uh, the justification for our being in Syria is to fight I Islamist extremists, uh, ironically some of whom we were aiding and supplying and training against the regime, um, and those extremists have essentially been defeated, then there's really no reason for our being there, especially in as much as Syria is a sovereign state and entitled to territorial integrity and freedom from foreign interference under international law, never mentioned. Uh, so I think Mr. Trump's instinct is correct. Uh, he should be dealing with Mr. Putin. I think the country, um, the Congress, and the media are way off base in um, trying to stop that. Uh, but having said that, going into a summit with no preparation um, and a mentality which, uh, which insists that our president knows everything he needs to know from Fox News, does not need to read intelligence reports or think very much about anything because he already knows everything he needs to know. Um, I think in dealing with someone as crafty as Mr. Putin, this is a hell of a gamble. Um, and uh, I, I don't... I. I much as I would like to see us do something with the Russians, I, this is not the way to do it. How do you see that playing that same scenario? Please wait for the North, microphone. North Korea <laughs> with uh, Bolton and uh, Pompeo and no diplomacy working and our president. What, what would you imagine would happen? And this is talking about having it happen in a month or so. Well, I, yeah, we're talking about a summit putatively in a month. April 27th. There will be a summit between the, the president of South Korea, uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, Mr. Moon, and uh, Chairman Kim in the north. Um, I think we may be making a mistake in paying so much attention to what happens between us and North Korea when, in fact, underlying everything is this South-North yeah. Korean rivalry and kinship. Uh, because if you've ever dealt with Koreans, you know that uh, they are intensely nationalistic and proud of their Koreanness, and that extends to both of the political systems that are on the on the peninsula. 
Uh, so it's entirely possible, I'm not predicting this, but that Mr. Moon and Mr. Kim will strike a deal. Not about nuclear weapons, um, which will remain a deterrent of American regime change for the North, uh, but about how to manage the future peaceful coexistence on the Korean Peninsula, including the phase out of the U.S. forces there, um, which would be very popular among the Korean public, although not the military. Um, so that's the first event. And the second event is, uh, uh, is Kim Jong-un and uh, Donald Trump. Um, in the meantime, however, Mr. Kim stole a march on everyone by going to Beijing which he had never visited, um, and where he is widely despised. And everybody on both sides held their noses and kissed in front of the cameras, and Kim Jong-un sat there taking notes as Xi Jinping um, fraternally instructed him, and um, uh, made the Chinese very happy. And of course, he got the usual absolutely awesome Chinese snow job uh, in return. And um, I think um, coming out of this is something very interesting. A few days ago, the Chinese said, well, actually, we think there should be a four-way meeting. Uh, we think it's time to turn the armistice into a peace. And we think we should do that in a meeting between South Korea, North Korea, um, US, and China. Now, in the past, uh, the line in North Korea and, and by, 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 uh, by echo in China was uh, the problem, North Korea has to meet with the United States. Uh, this is between North Korea and the United States. It's the U.S. that's threatening North Korea, and the U.S. has got to deal with that. And, and we don't have to be in the room. So the Chinese have withdrew their troops from Korea in the late 50s. They haven't been there for a long time. So they said, well, there's nothing for us to talk about. We're not involved. Um, now they're saying, let's have a four-way meeting. And then after that, maybe we could have a, some kind of six-party talk, which would bring in the Japanese who are feeling very isolated, and the Russians, who are always looking for relevance. So um, this is a very interesting uh, set of uh, developments that Mr. Trump's uh, unexpected and impulsive acceptance of a summit with the North Korean leader has set off. And I don't think there's anybody anywhere at this point, except maybe in Pyongyang, who can tell you uh, where this is likely to end up. But Chaz, isn't that good diplomacy on your yeah. I mean, Trump oh, uh, has Mr. changed, that changed Mr. the Kim's, questions. Mr. Kim's part, it's very good diplomacy. Mm. Um, he's done, for, you have to realize, uh, just on this, um, uh, Koreans, um, uh, believed they were serious, and with much justification, believed they were seriously maimed by the Japanese. They have no affection whatsoever for Japan and the Japanese. The North Koreans are the, that regime is the descendant of the resistance to the Japanese occupation. The South Korean regime is the descendant of the collaborators with the, with the Japanese. Um, there is a big issue between them over this, a competition for nationalist credentials. Mr. Kim has just aced out Japan. They're not in this. He seized control of the issue for himself and inferentially the South Koreans, um, implicitly the South Koreans. Um, the Russians, who as I say are always running around to try to get into the parade and appear to be important, uh, are not involved at all. Uh, the Chinese seem to have been enlisted by Mr. Kim in support of his stabilization agenda in Korea. Uh, so Mr. Kim has shown himself to be pretty astute. Um, in addition to having, you know, waited for all, all to do all this until he had a credible nuclear deterrent, which I don't think he's going to give up. So uh, maybe a long time from now. Uh, I did participate in the talks that led to the South Africans giving up their 
nuclear deterrent. Um, so it's not entirely impossible, but the circumstances are remarkably different. Is there any diplomatic back channel there? With North Korea? No, not really. I mean, we have contacts, but that's about it. The quest the question here? Oh, I just have a basic question about the U.S. Foreign Service. Compared to 60 years ago, what percent of U.S. ambassadorships are political appointees versus career diplomats? Slightly higher percentage are, are political. But then it's the wrong question because uh, a great many ambassadorships are simply vacant. There's nobody. There's no ambassador of the United States in Seoul, despite all the Korean issues we're dealing with. Um, I imagine the American ambassador in Beijing, who is the former governor of Iowa and concerned about pork exports, <laughs> is um, a bit unhappy at the moment. Um, there is no American ambassador in Riyadh. Uh, we have just nominated somebody for the United Arab Emirates, but there's been nobody there. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in Egypt either, but I might be wrong. Um, anyway. Um, we do have an ambassador in Beijing and one in Moscow, um, John Huntsman in Moscow, uh, Terry Bradford in... Um, I thought he was a Chinese speaker, the one in Moscow. He, he is. Um, he is a... He was a Mormon missionary in Taiwan. He learned pretty good Chinese. Um, he was ambassador in Singapore, which is an English-speaking country, basically, but uh, where Chinese is the second official language. Uh, and of course, he served in Beijing and was quite effective, I think. I and mean, sometimes political appointees, especially those with experience, significant experience in government, can be very good. And, and I think he, he has been. Why he went to Moscow other than to accommodate the Republicans who wanted to get him out of Utah politics, uh, I do not know. Maybe a better question is, uh, have uh, applications to be in the U.S. Foreign Service increased or decreased? Over decreased the last uh, substantially. Um, but as I will discuss in the next, the third final lecture, um, all the things that are happening are having an impact uh, not only on uh, personnel, with a huge number of people leaving, um, taking with them decades of experience which can't be replicated. Uh, but we have, for example, a 13% fall in foreign visitors to this country. Mr. Trump's xenophobic immigration policies are working if the purpose is to uh, isolate us. Uh, so uh, the Foreign Service uh, applications are way down. Um, intake is way down. That was something that Mr. Tillerson uh, did. He did not. If you have a system, Foreign Service is like the U.S. Navy. Uh, it's an up-or-out system. You come at the bottom. If you're not promoted in a certain time or, you're, or you fall short in performance, you're out. Um, and most people get to a point in the career, let's say they're commander, ca uh, com a captain in the Navy, um, and they can't go above that. And uh, it's an honorable retirement position. The Foreign Service is very much like that. If you don't take people in, but they're leaving, your whole organization begins to fall apart. Questions? Uh, yes, in the back. One of the things that I'm wondering is, is there a role for diplomacy actually right now in the mess, the Skripal mess? Because basically, UK, a NATO m member, has accused a foreign nation of, a t of, a t of an attack on British soil. Right. And given the events of yesterday at the OPCW, it doesn't look like there's going to be any way to back down from that. So we, you had mentioned in the last thing that Russia's diplomatic corps is doing a pretty good job, but they didn't do well yesterday. No, so I, th I think that's, that's right. So if that's the case, then it's going to be up to the UK to pull back. And I, I don't know who's going to try and rein this in before things get out of hand. Um, I suspect that everybody has an interest in not going any further. Um, and that uh, one has to distinguish the expulsion 
of individuals from the abolition of the position that they occupied. Uh, I would be very surprised not to see many of the positions that were vacated slowly refilled uh, on all sides uh, because they do useful work. Um, and not everyone who was expelled uh, is demonstrably an intelligent ag intelligence agent. Uh, one of the great sadnesses in, in terms of a lasting legacy is the closure of consulates, Seattle and St. Petersburg. Um, I won't weep for the Russian loss of access to the Pacific Northwest, uh, but I think loss of access to the second great city in Russia, in European Russia, is a, a big loss for the United States in terms of understanding that country uh, and um, making our own case to Russians uh, for, for our principles and our interests. Uh, but I think the positions themselves are likely over time to reappear. As I said, right now it looks like this is going to go through on the UK side. Okay, Russia attacked the UK. They're a NATO member. You know, where are the diplomats who are trying not to make that finalize in that way? Well, I, I don't know precisely what went on. Is it in the, was it in The Hague or? Basically, the OPCW um, director general said, okay, yeah, we got, you know, it happened on the 4th, we got samples on the 23rd, and we'll come out with a report next week. And meanwhile, the Russians were saying they, that under Article 9 of the convention, the UK should be showing them what they've got and say, we think it was you, so that the Russians can respond and say, no, it wasn't, in some sort of formalized yeah, I, manner. I, I, and they didn't get that. Basically, the OPCW said, no, you, no, UK doesn't have to talk to you. I, I suspect that this is not going to escalate too much farther. It's not in anybody's interest for it to do that. Um, I could understand, given all of the false flag operations that we've seen, particularly in the chemical weapons area over the last two decades, why the Russians would be insistent on that point. Uh, on the other hand, uh, frankly, um, they have a well-established record of bald-faced lying. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, as you say, this is not the finest hour for Mr. Lavrov and company. Uh, one has to assume Mr. Lavrov did not uh, direct this, um, uh, but that some other part of the Russian establishment did, if indeed the Russians did do it, uh, which I think there's no reason to doubt. Well, it's not a question of, of who did what quite frankly. It, that actually doesn't matter. The point is the accusation has been made and it certainly looks like that accusation is going to stick. <coughs> then what? Then we have uh, an impasse for a while. Um, you know, these things have happened, similar things have happened before. In the end, national interest tends to uh, steady things like this. Um, I don't think the UK has any interest in pushing this farther. Mrs. May has taken a stand, a strong one. Well, and uh, maybe let's let's so move on. I don't think it's going to get smoothed out. Clearly. Are, are there any final questions? I have a, a, a quick question. For All right. In your first lecture, maybe today too, but correct me if I'm I'm wrong on this. You you, you said that the the primary task of American diplomacy and foreign policy is to secure an international environment that's conducive to the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness at home, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense. But my question is, is that an operationalizable principle? I mean, it's, it's useful for criticizing virtually everything, for a forward strategy, for a strategy of withdrawal, but it, in what ways is that an operational Concept, oh, I think either strategically or, or tactically. I think it's strategically operational, and it was operationalized in the multilateral order that we built, uh, which included things like the United Nations Charter, now much forgotten, um, uh, whole bodies of international law, many of which, uh, despite our proposing them, we did decline to ratify into our own law, uh, incorporate into our own law. 
the whole body of the Geneva uh, Conventions, um, the the um, uh, various conventions on human rights, on the law of the sea, which basically codified uh, the rules of the road on the oceans in a way that the U.S. Navy uh, liked. Um, the all of these things, on the multilateral level, were directly a result of that uh, objective. Um, I think when you get down into the tactical level, um, all that you can derive from that objective is a principle of caution, maybe an ergonomic approach to foreign policy in which you don't waste energy or take unnecessary risks. Um, but um, uh, some, some of what I was talking about today, uh, especially uh, in the economic area, um, is directly relevant to this. Um, I'm be we're beginning to see figures, by the way, on uh, the impact of the tariffs that are being proposed if they actually go into effect, which of course they haven't um, and uh, may not, but um, I'm not sure, given what I know of the negotiating strategy, how we avoid going through with what we've threatened. Um, and interestingly, uh, people have done analysis now showing the impact on parts of the country um, by, by, by how they voted in 2016. And the Trump territories are going to get have a major draw, job loss. Uh, the, the Clinton territories, far less. Um, the Chinese obviously did their homework in proposing uh, retaliatory uh, tariffs. Um, the knock-on effects of much of this, starting with steel, of course, um, is obvious. Um, things like pipelines uh, require specialty steel that evidently we don't make anymore. Uh, so that has to be imported. Um, that raises the costs of energy. Um, I was listening this morning to the radio, some fellow in California said that he had just postponed the purchase of a lot of farm equipment because of the prospect of tariffs and a uh, Chinese ban on, the, on his, his produce. Uh, so there are going to be all sorts of knock-on effects. I think we're barely, we're just seeing the beginning of a political storm over this. Um, whether, our, whether Mr. Trump will show that he is a man of principle and constancy, unlike the other politicians in Washington, um, is something we will have to watch carefully. Great. An apt answer, because the third lecture is Diplomacy is Risk Management. Yes. Please join me in thanking Chas Freeman.